Okay. Um, my name is Aaron Leverett. This is Bruce Stenning. We are CEOs of companies that we just made up. Um, that's sort of true, but genuinely, he's a startup, I'm a startup. That's how it is. So it's really late in the day. I was traveling for 24 hours. 24 hours ago, I was in Cleveland. So I'm kind of exhausted and a little bit, you know, fuzzy. So if you give me lots of energy, I'll give you lots of energy, and Bruce and I will have some fun. So um, how many of you are still awake? Put your hand up. Okay, just checking. How many of you have bosses? All right, some of you. How many of you have bosses that uh, like to invent vaporware that you have to implement? <laughs> you know why I'm about to do this presentation. That's, that's what this is all about. My boss uh, at the Center for Risk Studies in Cambridge is a really, really clever guy, but he doesn't do the cybers. Um, and he likes to talk about APTs. And so he does stuff like, ask me, how many people are in Energetic Bear? Uh, you know, how much money do they spend on this type of ransomware? And I'm like, how the hell would I know that, right? Um, but then an idea started to form, this idea of logistical budget. Um, so basically, that's what this entire presentation is about. Bruce is going to tell you a little bit about uh, the implementation because I didn't have the time <laughs> to implement stuff. So I used my speaker fees at other conferences to get Bruce uh, to do this work for me, partly because Bruce taught me to program, and he's a better programmer. So I'll let him introduce some of this. Okay, so as Aaron said, we want to be able to present stuff uh, to non-technical people um, so that they know which threats to con concentrate on and um, what to concentrate stuff on, uh, which threat, threat actors can do the most damage, and uh, same for ransomware. Um, they can get an, uh, an overview from reading literature, um, but what if we can actually generate visualization directly from MISP data uh, in an easy to understand and repeatable way. Uh, and we want to be able to visualize historical data too to see how uh, threat infrastructure is um, changing. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so has anyone heard the, the, the term logistical burden before? No? Yeah, sort of? Okay. So um, I was working at the Center for Risk Studies, and they do all kinds of risks. They do environmental risk. They do, um, you know, uh, labor unrest. They do interbank lending risk, whatever. It was great. I got to hang out with all these amazing people, and so I was working with these counterterrorism professionals, and they came to me. We were talking about adversarial risk, like how do you quantify adversaries that change and adapt and think and do stuff, right? Um, and they introduced me to the concept of logistical burden. So you go to a site, uh, let's say like a ship or a building, and you you take some special forces people and you ask them to estimate how many people would it take to storm this building or to drive a truck bomb here? How much money would it cost? How big would the bomb need to be? These, these kinds of questions, right? And they estimate the size of a threat that would be required for a particular uh, target, right? Now, I didn't particularly want to do that. I, I realized we could do this the other way around, and that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about. It's if we take indicators and we assume that they have a cost in money, manpower, or time, then we can start to get a sense of the logistical budget of different APT actors, right? Okay, so we wanted to quickly prototype some visualizations. Um, so we used PyMISP to uh, grab data from Aaron's MISP server uh, and Pickle to uh, cache it locally so that we can very quickly iterate through stuff. Uh, so what we want to do is um, scan through MISP events and attributes and filter based on galaxies and date ranges and then accumulate score for uh, the entities that we found. Uh, and we used Plotly initially for heat maps um, uh, because it's really easy to output data that Plotly understands um, and later on GNU plot for uh, a bit more flexibility, but it has its own um, uh, drawbacks. <laughs> I think probably it's easier. <laughs> um, so first, we generated heat maps for threat back to activity, uh, and then generated scorecards which are comparable. Uh, with each other for threat actors, but also ransomware because it was a really easy extension. Um, 
one of the things I struggled with, not having Aaron's background in threat intelligence and MISP, um, was domain knowledge. Uh, so uh, after grabbing the data from the server, uh, we quickly wrote a Python script to uh, dump the fields and to count frequencies and sort on them. That made it very easy to uh, get a better understanding of what data is in Aaron's MISP server and how we should be writing scoring functions. Um, so this is a kind of stuff that we got out there. Go back. Go back one. So this speaks very much to your point, Andras, about you know when people first encounter a MISP server, they don't know what the fields are, they don't know what the data looks like, and it's fine if you're like a front-end user using the GUI, but you sometimes need to dig around in, inside the MISP uh, server to figure out what, what you've got. And, and an interesting point here is we wanted to start with um, with things that had attribution, that had threat actors attributed to the events, um, which is not my favorite thing to work on. Like attribution is essentially a political act and I find it very complicated. So the first thing we wanted to know is what percentage of, uh, of events inside my MISP server were attributed to a particular threat actor. And it was like 8%. I imagine most of you, it's fairly similar. So one of the things we can talk about later is how we might increase that in the future. And uh, some of the work you were doing uh, would work really well with that, right? So. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the scoring functions. Um, we really want to discuss the scoring functions of the community. Um, they're kind of a uh, first stab. Um, uh, they can be approved uh, a great deal. Um, currently, we're looking at context-free analysis. So we're looking at uh, an event and the event's attributes um, with no correlation of other data uh, within MESP. me saying a few things about this as well. So this scoring idea is essentially how do you translate uh, observables or IOCs into one of or all three of money, manpower, time? And it's not as easy as it might seem, right? Like what is an IPv4 address worth to an attacker? If an attacker switches from one IPv4 address to another, what would you say the cost is in money? Come on, be interactive. I'm really exhausted. <laughs> Anybody? Fairly low, right? It's not, it's not super hard. Um, so I wanted to put an actual number on that. I went digging around in IPv4 auctions, and you can basically buy a new IPv4 address for four bucks. So there's a number I can put on it, right? And we all agree that's not the right number, but what I'm trying to get here is that we can put a sort of constant of scores on like how long a kilobyte of binary takes to write. And some of you could go out and do further research on that, which is what we want to talk about here. But for now, the point is that everybody shares the same number. So when I was at the Center for Risk Studies, there was a, a brilliant counterterrorism risk professional who's written a couple of books on the subject, Gordon Wu. And, um, and he said to me, all risks should be comparable, uh, or all risks are comparable or should be. And I found that really frustrating because it's like, you know, what we do is special. It's different. It's, it's not like other risks. But if you've really progressed in the risk world, then you can be compared to fire risk, or you can be compared to pandemic risk, or you can be compared to kidnapping and ransom or piracy or whatever. So that's the point here, is by putting some of these numbers on here, all of these different APTs and all of the different ransomware families can be compared. Even if we know those numbers aren't exactly right, the constant is wrong for all of them, and we can at least compare them. So Bruce will show you more about uh, how he achieved that. Okay, so the... Scoring functions are kept separate from the mechanics, so you don't have to be an expert in or understand how the mechanics work to be able to write scoring functions. Um, and as I said before, the dump of the attribute data is really useful for writing them. That's almost impossible to read, even for myself. So, But it's basically just a really simple piece of Python that takes in the event and the um, corresponding attributes and scans through and uh, accumulates based on the attribute data, and then returns the score. If you have a URL, it's worth this much time to manage. If you have a URL, it's got uh, this much time to manage, or this much money. If you've got an IP address, it's worth this. You get the idea. If you've got a binary, and it's of this size, then you have some idea of like how much time the threat actor put into it. So that's all there in that code. Uh, so the scorecards that I mentioned before um, look something like this. So we're trying to estimate the organization size and the amount that they're spending uh, in for on infrastructure, uh, the estimated um, time investment. Uh, and this is 
we're going to compare Dharma and WannaCry, um, and we can see that we're, we're giving some fuzziness to the to the actual results. Um, but if we look at WannaCry, uh, we get much bigger uh, organization size, um, uh, spend, and time investment. Um, so these are, should be noted that these are log graphs, so the ticks are a little bit uh, disingenuous, but uh, they're there for comparison with um, different scorecards. And that's important because some threat actors operate at like an insane scale. So like you look at the number of URLs involved in a SOFACY campaign and it's just extreme. So you have to do some of these things on a log scale, right? And the score across the bottom, for those of you who can't read all of these, it's uh, estimated organizational size at the top. That's the yellow one. Infrastructure spend, so the amount of money is the red one. Uh, time is the blue one. And the last one that's in black is basically the aggregation of those three different scores, right? So if we click back and forth between these two, you just get the idea that Dharma probably spent less money, manpower, and time than WannaCry. And that's all we really wanted to do with this. Um, but of course, you don't have to do this just for ransomware. You can do it for other things too, right? So we can also do this um, for the threat actors. So we, here we have Energetic Bear um, and Equation Group. Um, and then we have uh, heat maps that we generated for the threat actors. Um, so this is taking uh, threat actor events, um, 15 bins of 30 days, um, and then ranking them uh, based on their aggregate score. Um, so we can get some nice uh, idea of uh, bright points uh, and corresponding dates. Uh, sorry. Uh, and we can also do the same for weekly plots, 15 uh, bins. Um, this is uh, the events, but scaled based on their uh, threat levels. So the high gets a significantly higher score than a medium or a low. And we didn't want to put like 200 of these heat maps in here, but we can do them not just for events. We can also do them for binaries or for networks or for files or for whatever. Um, and then we worked on a sort of scoring function that took all of those into account and made one. Now, it's worth pointing out here that the uh, time bin across the bottom is detection time. And we all know that dwell time can be really high. So I don't take the timeline of this entirely seriously, but I do take the heat map uh, to be of interest. So what I'm trying to say there is that, you know, this little white spot here for Sophocy might have actually occurred uh, a time bin before or before that in terms of when the attack occurred. So this is detection time. But it still, it still lets us know that there was a, a lot more indicators in that time period uh, that we could use for something. So yeah, this is an idea of the code that uh, Bruce has written. And we've made open source on GitHub. Um, we have other ideas of how we can visualize. Like perhaps you would do a uh, tree map sort of structure where the the files would be on uh, one side and like you know the um, the network indicators would be on the other, uh, or we can do heat maps for ransomware. We've got a lot of ideas about how to visualize this data, uh, but we probably need a little bit of help. Um, and then we want to talk a lot about scoring functions. So if you know that there's academic work. Uh, estimating the amount of time that went into a binary based on how many kilobytes it is or how much uh, network infrastructure costs for attackers or so on. Um, I'm also giving a talk tomorrow about ransomware where you'll see a little bit more about where some of this came from and some of that uh, work is replicated there in terms of how much an incident costs uh, by comparison to how much attackers made in ransoms. Um, yeah, I think that was... Maybe everything that you said. Uh, oh, can we use unattributed mess data in our visualizations? Yeah. How does the community feel about this? How do you feel like it should be extended? <laughs> well, I mean, so this wasn't super expensive, like Bruce works really hard and he's got a new company, but like like I said, this is my speaker fees for a couple months, right? Um, and I'm really glad about that, but we do think it could go a lot further. So if you're interested or you have time, we don't necessarily need money, we also just need people to contribute. So, you know, 
we could just give it to you guys and you can do something with it if you want. That's fine too. But I'm also interested in the reaction from the community. Like, is this total BS because it's based on money, manpower, and time and you don't like the scoring function? Or do you actually think this is useful? Would you sit around comparing APT groups and ransomware? Thanks. No, no I mean, uh, uh, from I think from our perspective, it looks really interesting. And maybe something that could be interesting as well is, uh, especially once you're refining uh, your scoring for the different types uh, after a while, would you be interested, for example, in feeding that data back into the threat actor galaxies? Because this would, I, th I think, would be very valuable for the community out there uh, to, to get this information. And, and then for further developments, we can, we, can, we, should, we should talk about this. Yeah, that's the other thing. So we, ha we basically have a bigger research ongoing for uh, the expiration of indicators. And we're looking at different components and different uh, things that we can take into account. So we, we could work together on that as well. So, yes, I think we should have a talk while we're here. Thanks. There's another question back here. Exactly. So I'll repeat the question for the cameras, uh, as I'm supposed to, even though I'm tired, I remember the rules of Cooper. Um, so essentially, software development houses have that data already, and that's the sort of thing that we should be incorporating. So once they've written a piece of software, you could look at it and work backwards and say, how many people did you have on this project for how long, um, and how much did it cost, and so on. Now, th the costing would be the one I would question. Uh, in terms of timing, that's probably all very accurate when you compare malware and you compare standard software. Uh, but in terms of money, uh, it might not be the same pay structure in the underground economy, right? <laughs> People might be coding uh, for a share of the ransomware profits or um, you know, they might be stealing other people's code before they get started. There's a lot of details in there. But, but I absolutely take your point that traditional software um, uh, development studies are useful to this. And we didn't dig that deep into this because we just wanted the proof of concept where we could show you the visualization first and then we could deep dive on each of those numbers, especially if we can get you interested to, to help us with that. So great idea. Next question. So the, the comment is essentially about the associativity of tags inside MISP events. Yeah, of course. I mean, the more that the correlation engines run underneath, the more that we will have uh, possible to visualize, right? Especially if you're enriching events where, like, you happen to know this domain and this domain are linked by who is data, and then it, it grows, right? Um,
Yes. I mean, we know that we have a naming convention problem for ransomware and APTs uh, because it's essentially marketing reports that we get most of this information from, which is... Yes. Uh, in fact, I would counter this entire conversation with the fact that you can run our code on your MISP instance. So if your confidence in your MISP classifications is better, then you can do the visualization on your data. That's why we wrote it this way. So... Any other questions or comments? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, you did some lightweight analysis in that sort of uh, area, but not uh, not in a scientifically rigorous way. Uh, and it's absolutely something we'd like to do. It's just we wanted to prove the concept with the visualization and then talk to people about how to do that. So if you're interested, uh, we'd love your help. And I think I have to wrap up for the next speakers. That's it from us. <laughs>